Thank you for listening to Mormon Sex Info. This episode is an archived episode and is only now becoming publicly available. Mormon Sex Info relies on contributions. To contribute, please visit mormonsex.info. And now, please enjoy this episode. Welcome to Mormon Sex Info. This is Natasha Helfer Parker, and I am so pleased to have Paul Jonides with me today. He is the author of quite an incredible series of books and editions called The Guide to Getting It On. And the best way I know how to explain this is just the encyclopedia of anything you want to know about sexuality. So I'm super excited to have him on the show and to be able to talk about this work that he's been up to for quite a while. And uh, so welcome, Paul, to the show. Thank you so much for being here. And if you wouldn't mind starting us off with just telling us about yourself, what are you about? What's your training about? Where do you come from? Well, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here with you. I am a research psychoanalyst. It means you went to college for way too long. (laughs) And uh, oh boy, I wrote a book on sex that ended up, I never, never in my wildest dreams did I think, you know, 20 years later, the ninth edition would be released. But it is, and it pretty well taken up a huge amount of my time in my life, because I'm kind of fastidious about keeping it updated. Things have changed dramatically in 20 years. If you think about it, when I was sitting on the beach next to Malibu 25 years ago, writing that book, the first edition, there was no internet. Cell phones were the size of a brick. Right. Um, you know, if you said phone, it meant it was wired to the wall. If you said porn in, in the first edition, I maybe used the word porn twice. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't relevant. And now in the ninth edition, I have four chapters on porn. And I've written the whole book from the perspective of someone who's been watching Pornhub since they were in middle school, because I don't care what part of the country or world you're in, that's pretty much the reality of today's young adults. That's how they learn about sex. Mm. So things have changed, even though we still seem to have the same genitals and some of the same hopes for sex, a lot has changed. And back then, when you wanted a phone, you really cared about the sound quality. Now, no one even asks about the sound quality. It's all about the camera. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> Lots of implications there. I, <laughs> I, who it was. I think it was Marty Klein who says, any form of technology pretty quickly gets used in a sexual way. You know, we figure out how to use those things in sexual ways. So that's kind of a fun thing. Yeah. Was your training necessarily in sexuality or research? Or like, how did you get interested in the sexual piece of this? I never had a single course on sex or sexuality, ever. It's kind of strange because my book is used in medical schools now. Uh, So that's scary. (laughs) But, okay, uh, back to reality. Um, (laughs) Let's see, how did it start? Well, I was originally writing a series of books for high school kids, not on sex, for kids on science who weren't traditional learners and didn't like to learn from traditional books. And the first one was on the chemistry and physics of skateboard wheels, bikinis, and surfboard cores. Because interestingly enough, those are all made from the same molecule. Those all come from the urethane molecule. And it just depends on what you add to it, how you process it, that in one way it turns out to be spandex, which gives a bikini a zing. Another way, it's hard as a skateboard wheel. And another way, it turns out to be like a surfboard core. And so I was having fun with that. The only problem was none of the schools wanted it because it had too much of a sense of humor. Mm. And they didn't want that. They want students to go to sleep. (laughs) And I was broke as broke could be. And so I was thinking, well, you know, I was thinking I'd do one on sex, you know, maybe number seven after Shakespeare for surfers or, or something like that. But I was broke. So I thought, OK, I'll move this one on sex up to the top because at least that should sell and I could get some money so I don't have to keep eating peanut butter and scrambled eggs each night for dinner. And so 
years later, I was still writing that darned book on sex. I had no idea what a task it would be. And it wasn't until eight or nine years later that it was finally done. And then no publisher in the country would touch it because they said it has too much of a sense of humor and no one wants an irreverent book on sex for a how-to book. They want it to be like the joy of sex. In fact, one publisher, one of the most liberal publishing companies, St. Martin's Press, said, well, you know, I was just in North Carolina this weekend, and I can assure you no one in North Carolina would ever buy this book, ever. Oh, wow. Well, the book is now used in two universities in North Carolina. It's a signed reading. Yeah. So it's kind of nice to get the last laugh, but there was nothing easy about it. Sure. So that's how this all came about. So it sounds like a big driving force for you was presenting information in a way that would seem relevant, maybe especially to students or to young adults, because a lot of times, yeah, professional books are dry, boring. We use professional language. It can be a little bit off-putting for just a general audience. You know, if people say, well, you had no train, no courses in sex education or no training in sex education, actually... I think the main training was in psychoanalysis and learning about anxiety mm -hmm. and how subtle and destructive anxiety can be. I wasn't aware of it, but when I was writing the book, it was all about how do we deal with anxiety about sex? How do we make it safe to talk to a partner? In some ways, it's even worse today than it was back then. I've talked to college instructors today who say this is the most ill-informed generation they've ever seen about sex. And this doesn't make sense because they grew up watching really the most explicit hardcore porn in the history of the world. And how is it that they're the most ill-informed about sex? And you look at the internet, they can look up anything on the internet. Well, the trouble is if I write a chapter in my book or I'm revising it, I take months. Yeah. I research one side and down the other side. Do you think they really do that with articles in Cosmo? Right, right. So even what we think should be credible sources have incredible amounts of misinformation in them. Including and they're really public, misleading. Even our public education systems have a lot of misinformation in them. I mean, that's what's so crazy about sexuality. It's just it's hard to know, like you're saying, what is backed up by research and evidence-based issues or what is just kind of myth or folklore or one person's experience. You're absolutely right. And remember, our, our government just spent $2 billion on abstinence-only sex education, which was at its core, its intent was to shame women for having sexual feelings and to misinform. And now what's really frightening is how is it? We're starting to see research that's showing a lot of young adults feel really bad about women's genitals. A lot of women feel bad about their genitals. And it's not the positive experience. It's not a great positive thing. I mean, geez, having a clitoris should be a wonderful thing. You should jump for joy if you've got one of those. But that's not how people are looking at it. And so we need to remember, especially as sex educators, we've lost our way. What people need from us is help with the basics. They don't need us to tell them what gender they should be or what pronoun they should use. They need us to help them feel comfortable talking to a partner about sex and to feel comfortable exploring our bodies and learning what feels good and then how to communicate that to a partner. Well, I love that you started with this idea of your training and anxiety. You know, I see that a lot, of course, in my clientele where there's, of course, this overlay of religious values and expectations and what it means to be a sexual being and how that's a sense organized also from this realm of spirituality and religious belief. So it gets a little bit complicated when, for example, something a standard that you have or a value that you have is not necessarily what you're experiencing in your body, such as, well, masturbation, right? Or, if, you know, there's lots of religions that still see masturbation as a sin or same-sex attraction or sexuality between same-sex people that, again, in my religion, that's a big issue as far as how it's seen from that perspective of religion. And even without all those things, I just see a lot of anxiety in general within Mormonism, kind of the background that we have here in the United States as far as our puritanical roots. There's just so much mm -hmm. anxiety around what it means to be, A, sexually okay, normal, whatever you want to call that, and what you're talking about is how to have an okay relationship with another person. So 
it's seeped in anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. When people ask me why I wrote the book that I did, a uh, book on sex, I usually say it was revenge for eight years in Catholic school. Oh, um, yeah. But <laughs> it's very fascinating. You would think people would say, wow, okay, if you believe that God made the human body, what was God thinking when he made the clitoris? He must have been drinking that day. I mean, the clitoris is there for one purpose and one purpose only, sexual pleasure. There's no governor on it. There's no calendar on it that says you can only enjoy touching it three times a month, or you can only enjoy it for procreation, or if you're a woman, the only person who can enjoy it is a man or your partner. You can't enjoy it yourself. There's nothing written about that. That, that isn't why it was invented. <laughs> if that had been the case, that would have been one of the, the 11th commandment, thou shalt not touch thy genitals. <laughs> right. So it's interesting what we've done to ourselves and shame. I'm not a person who feels that shame is unwarranted. Shame is a good thing. Too much shame is not, and shame where it doesn't belong is not. Yeah, that's the tricky part, is knowing when shame belongs and when it doesn't, right? And so that's a huge component of people I work with as well is what I call an inappropriate shame. So if you're hurting somebody, if you've done something really egregious, then I agree with you, shame can be a motivating force, right, to move you away from those kinds of things, and yet... Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully, right. But, That's a whole other issue. People who need to feel more shame don't. <laughs> people who don't need to feel yes. shame do. <laughs> it's, it's exactly. The people who feel too much shame shouldn't, and the people who don't feel any shame should feel a lot of shame. Right, right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that okay. Well, going back to your thoughts about anxiety, one of the things, and you also mentioned humor, yeah, you are funny. You are blunt. You use slang words you, you you know that are pretty typical in the culture to use you are very upfront and you know you have a lot of descriptors and also illustrations showing exactly what you're talking about i guess i would say it's kind of a non apologetic real and kind of in your face type of book about really good information so is that what you mean by addressing anxiety that you wanted to just kind of put it out there and normalize so much of what our bodies can do and what they're capable of. That would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you can figure that one out and package it, <laughs> you're going to be a very wealthy person. Yes. I think that would be a great thing. But, you know, another incredibly fortunate piece of luck with my book was discovering the illustrator is one of the top illustrators in the world. I mean, he started off doing the X-Men for Marvel Comics. It was fascinating, the process. Uh, there's over 150 illustrations in the book, but each one was probably like giving birth. Yeah. I'd, I'd come up with a concept, and he'd run with it, and then we'd have to tweak it. And something that I never realized, and I guess he didn't either until we started working together, if you look at comic book characters, like look at any of the Marvel comics or any of those, they're posers. Their connection is with you as the reader. Their connection isn't so much with each other. And so this was a big shift for him, having to make it less voyeuristic and more, how do we give these characters connection to each other? I don't know if I'm making sense. This is something we've wrestled with for years, but I don't know quite how to explain it. But how to make two figures when you're only using a black line on white paper, no shading, anything, how to make them engaging and then make them look like they're relating to each other. That's an incredible talent. I was very, very fortunate to have found, you know, probably the best there is. That's Derek Gross, who's the illustrator. So that was a real stroke of luck. And I love hearing that that's part of your conversation that you were even cognizant and mindful about that because it is interesting. I think throughout your book, one thing that does come up for me a lot is that relational quality, right? That this isn't just a how to on, because I think that's sometimes what people miss in sex therapy work. It's like, well, just show me what to do, but it's not just what to do, it's what to do in the context of the relationship you're in, right? Whether that's with yourself or with a partner or partners, whatever situation you're in. So 
I love that that was even something that all of you were talking about as you came up with these illustrations that you were cognizant of that. Yes, it was constant. That was a huge thing. You know, it's interesting. I'll have college students they'll say, I want to go into human sexuality or I want to be a sex therapist. What program do you think I should sign up for? Whatever. I will always say, if you're dealing with sex therapy, you should spend at least several years not dealing with sex at all, but dealing with couples therapy and learning how to do that and learning how to do counseling and psychology, death therapy. The stuff with sex is secondary to what's going on in the relationship. And if you can't help tap into what's going on in that relationship, you can have all the knowledge in the world about sex. It's not going to help that couple. And they always look at me very strangely because they want to just be sex therapists, go to a program two years, boom, do sex therapy. Right. Yeah. Good luck. (laughs) Well, and this is kind of, I think, at the heart of the act-based model, right? That somehow, okay, if I learn, and, and even, you know, you mentioned cosmopolitan. So, I can't pass the Cosmo aisle without seeing the 10 new ways that you're going to be able to give a better blowjob, right? Or the five new yeah. ways that you're going to be able to please your woman, you know, by rubbing her a certain way. And that can be helpful. And you have a lot of that in your book, you know, as far as details on how to touch, where to touch, what the anatomy is about. And at the same time, any one act, any one type of rubbing, given the context, can be very different whether it's somebody you trust, whether it's somebody that's new, whether it's an assaulter, whether it's, I mean, the context makes all the difference. There are certainly people who do great with one night stands where the context is thrown out the window, but that's not how most of us are. That, or maybe go through a phase in life where you do that. But it's funny, people, when they, they know I, we, we, uh, I'm the author of a book on sex. They tell you things that are they're interesting, and sometimes you want to say, "Oh, don't tell me that, please. I don't <laughs> want to know that about you." Uh, but this is a funny situation. The, one of the local truck drivers who brings the books to us here for our warehouse, he said, "I was a bouncer at a club in Los Angeles for a couple of years when I was young," and he said, "I'd go home with a new woman each night." And he said, "It started to get really tiring because I would say the next morning." well, can I see you? Can we go to a movie or do something? And he said, they couldn't have me out the door fast enough. No, they were, no. He had one purpose, and that was to be excellent in bed. And he said, eventually, I got over that. And I found a woman, and we've been married for 20 years. But he said it was interesting. It ended up getting tiring. And the lack of connection got tiring. And yet, most young guys would say, boy, that would, (laughs) I'd love to be him. Yeah, the mythology, right, that we have about what it means to be like a studly man or a a progressive or liberal. And and a lot of times I think that has that idea that you're sexually, you know, able to just go in without connection, have a good time, no strings attached. Again, sometimes that does work. And at the same time, that doesn't mean that all the mythology about that is correct. And I'm sure as a sex therapist, you, you deal with this all the time. There's also it cuts the other way too far too, where there's too much familiarity and there's not enough excitement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's this balancing act. You know, how do you keep that raw excitement going? On the other hand, when this is your partner and you rely on them, it's an interesting, interesting balance, isn't it? How to put it all together. Yeah, no, I agree. So ever since you got this book going, has it become the major focus of your life's work? In other words, you're doing continued volumes, right? You're con- like you said, you're continually making sure that they're well, updated. It's, yeah, it's the same book. It's just new editions. So we, we clear out the old edition and every two to three years I write a new edition. And so update everything and that's how it is. You know, I, something else comes to mind and that in terms of women today, I think that when we have Pornhub as the sex educator, and unfortunately we don't have good alternative sex education to really, that's that's helpful sex education. But so Pornhub is the sex educator. And so basically with Pornhub, there's no discussion. There's certainly no romance. I mean, kissing is pretty boring if you're trying to watch porn. But there's this idea that whatever the penis wants, the penis gets, and the woman should be ready for it right away and ready and willing. 
And I was speaking at UC Santa Barbara last year, the year before, something like that. And there were a good five or 600 students there. And a couple came up to me afterwards, a young couple, and uh, they said, you know, thank you. And I said, why? <laughs> I didn't know. And she said, well, I thought there was something strange about me because I need more than five minutes of kissing and caressing before I want to have intercourse. Oh, my goodness. More than five minutes. How about 15 or 20? <laughs> exactly. They didn't even know the word foreplay, right? That's an old geezer term. We're not allowed to use that anymore. And so we used to tell people, you know, 20 minutes average foreplay. But then we started getting sex education got weird and some women would say, well, but you're excluding people who are ready right away. So you can't say that anymore. So we, we stopped. We stopped saying that, but this couple didn't know. And then he said, yeah, and it was also helpful to know. He said, I can only last about eight or nine minutes during intercourse. And he said, I thought, you know, I had serious premature ejaculation. Oh my goodness. With eight or nine minutes, that's like hooray for you. That was it, exactly. But when porn is your model yeah, yeah. for what sex should be, and no one's telling these kids. You can't even, if a high school teacher even mentions porn, they'll get fired. Yeah, Yet kids are watching porn on their phone during lunch. So Unless, unless got, uh, that new organization, what is it? Porn is the new drug or something. Then school systems will bring them in to give supposedly education that is completely false as well. Just and, and all they'll try to do is shame people for watching porn. And it's just more shame, just throwing more shame. There's nothing wrong with watching porn is what I tell people, but understand the difference between that and sex in real life. Well, let me tell you what happened at our dinner table a few weeks ago. So I brought out your books. I have two of them, two different editions, and I put them on the table. I have three sons ages, let's see, 11 to 15 right now. And we had, and we've had lots of conversations about porn along the way, but I, I basically just said, look, I know that at times you're probably going to look at things that you don't want me to know about. That's probably just a reality of life. <laughs> and, uh, and these are books that are in my office and that are, kind of, I call them the encyclopedias of sex and anything you want to know probably in there. And you're welcome at them anytime you want. If you have any questions, of course, you can come to me. They know this about me that is traumatizing to them that I would want to answer questions. You know, I think every child of a sex therapist needs their own therapist at some point, just for the fact that we're waiting for the therapist. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but that's the conversation I had because, you know, I guess that's another term I would use for these books. This is comprehensive sexual education. This is information and it's not information based on what I wish you were or were not doing from my value system as a parent or as an educator or as a culture or community. It's facing the reality. It's like, this is what sexuality can or cannot be. And yeah, the value systems are there, but that's kind of like a different conversation. That's an additional conversation of what I think my values are or how I would want to teach values to my children. But comprehensive sexual education in of itself, in of the name, does not mean that we take out parts of sex ed because it doesn't fit our value system. Yeah, that is so totally correct and true. Unfortunately, somewhere along the line, we started defining values and personal integrity, you know, based on what you do when your pants are off as opposed to how you treat each other 99% of the time. There's a big difference between the two. And hopefully you take your values with you to bed, but you don't have what you do in bed define your values. I, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Mm. Yeah. But um, yeah, values are what people get, what your sons get from watching you and how you negotiate life and how you deal with them. And how you deal with your partners or whatever, that's, that's where they get their values from. It's not how many people you sleep with or it has nothing to do with what you do sexually. Right, right. Yeah, it's how you go about the doing of the things you're doing <laughs> or not doing. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yes. What would you say is maybe both on one side, the pushback you've received from this work that you've done and maybe like you mentioned, this couple that came up to you, what are some of the 
positives that people have given you as far as feedback? The feedback over the years has been wonderful. I mean, I, I just, people have been incredibly generous and kind. And, uh, you know, people really say negative things or unkind things to me about the book or, or that. So it's it's really been a wonderful journey. And I've met so many wonderful people through it. That's what's just incredible. But one of the things that's interesting, this isn't pushback from individuals, but this is kind of a, again, technology is changing everything kind of pushback. The last edition, the eighth edition of my book was 1,150 pages, something like that. And um, my bookstore distributor said, look, if you want this book to keep selling, you need to have it down to 500 pages. Oh, wow. I said, why? I said, why? And he said, because 500 pages is a huge amount for people today. They don't read large amounts of material. Think of how you are used to taking in information. It's in sentences and paragraphs, and then you click off of it instantly and onto something else. And he said, that's, you know, the book world is changing. We can't sell huge books. Mm -hmm. And so, well, I did take out 500 pages. I got it down to 624 pages. There were a lot of chapters in the back of the book, which were actually my favorite, but I know that not that many people read them. Uh, they're still, they buy a book on sex. They do want to know, they go right away how to give a better blowjob, right? They're not interested in sex in the 1800s, which I found more fascinating. But there were chapters that I put on my website for free that were in the back part of the book. Mm. But they're also in the ebooks. So the ebook has all the missing chapters. For the books that were in the bookstores, we had to, you know, it's down to 624 pages for the new edition. And in a lot of ways, I'm glad because it makes it more accessible to young adults who really do need to read a book on sex. But the idea of a 1,200 page book would frighten them. So it was great for college students who were assigned the book. They they had no problem. They'd buzz right through it. They'd say, yeah, this is a fun 1,200 pages. But For the rest of the world, it was just too much. So that was an interesting change of pushback, but that's pushback from culture and technology and how things are changing so much. And can you tell us, just I have it on the air, and I'll definitely be linking to these things, where all these things are available. So what's the... My website is guidetogetting.com, and it's guide, G-U-I-D-E, with the number two, and then the word getting. So it's the word guide, the number two, and the word getting.com. Strangely enough, I think next week or the week after, I'm actually going to launch a Pinterest site. Okay. I dislike Facebook intensely and I don't tweet well and all that, but I, I thought it would be fun to venture into something that's so totally new and different for me that it's really causing me a lot of anxiety and having to learn a lot. So that's a good thing. Oh, Pinterest is good because it, especially with some, I'm thinking of illustrations and things like that. And you know, I think Pinterest has a lot of like how to's like kind of flyers almost in a way. So I can see that being a good thing yeah. for sure. The infographics and yeah. I've also decided if you're going to have a Pinterest, no matter what, you need to be able to throw up slow cooker recipes. So I've had three slow cookers going for the last month. My yeah. family's eating much better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I finally found an absolute killer slow cooker cheesecake recipe. Oh my God, it's amazing. Ooh. (laughs) (laughs) And easy. (laughs) Oh, funny. All right. So, yeah. So I, of course, part of that makes me sad that because I love your big, thick book, I just feel like it has so much information, but I agree that we are in a culture where we want quick and easy, you know, short and sweet and make things accessible quickly. So I can see that. Aren't you also doing some videos and things that I saw on YouTube and do you have a YouTube channel or videos now that are coming out yes. of this umbrella of your brand? Yes. You can find them on the website at guide to getting.com. But also on YouTube, it's been an interesting experience. A little more than a year ago, I decided I would t- tackle Adobe After Effects, which is the program that animators use. I've spent a year now <laughs> taking about 200 tutorials. I'm trying to up my video skills. And so we've been doing different styles of video. And, and my wife also said, like, no one wants to watch anything that isn't funny. 
then why don't you start to take chances like you did when you first published your book? Mm. And so I looked around and we have a herd of llamas. And so we decided to create one who speaks. His name is Bob the Llama. So I have a speaking llama in some of them. <laughs> a good friend of mine who does voiceovers professionally agreed to be the voice of Bob. So he is just wonderful. Bob is a wonderful llama, talking llama. <laughs> and uh, he does sex education now with me. Yeah. So Awesome. I love it. I love it. Well, I'm going to, just for fun, I'm going to read some of the chapters in this book just to give a sense of the scope and also the language that you use. And by no means, (laughs) semen, (laughs) hand jobs, balls, 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 sex fantasies, anal sex, up your bum, gnarly sex germs, gender benders, snoring and gas, sex and hysterectomy, the horny pill and patch, hooking up sex, vulva care, keeping your kitty happy. You know, I could go on. So that kind of gives a little bit of a taste of your style. And I'm always a big proponent for using correct anatomical terms, you know, in the sense of when you're using basic education skills. And at the same time, I'm also a big proponent of humor and using the terms that we're culturally comfortable with, right? And that are kind of part of our vernacular and and not always being so formal. And so I think that you do a really good job of striking that balance. So any thoughts just on your style and what comes to mind as I read some of those (laughs) those chapter headings to you? (laughs) Well, I, I have no idea. I have no idea what depths of my psyche I pull those things from, but uh, there are things that make me laugh. And so, I don't know, I guess part of it's just having the courage to actually use them <laughs> instead of trying to, you know, mainstream it too much. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. Anyway. I think that that's probably why you've had a lot of success in people just being able to relate, you know, I think at times again, from a professional perspective, we can be too formal, too clinical. And so we lose some of that personal connection with those who are reading our work. So I think in a sense, we've been able to bridge that divide between the professional realm and kind of what's really happening day to day and in our bedrooms. Yeah. You know, there's a couple of things. You you said anatomical terms and use correct terms and whatever. For the first eight editions, I was just a fanatic on using the term vulva for women's genitals instead of vagina because, you know, I'd say, look, vulva is what describes what you see from the outside. And people call that vagina, but the vagina is part of the vulva that you don't see really from the outside. And you know, I'd give the old story of, well, what if someone, instead of saying your face, when they met your face, they just said your mouth? Well, that would be misleading. And so I've always said, well, we need to call women's genitals the correct thing. With this ninth edition, the unzipped edition, I actually went back and I started calling it vagina. Because when I'd say vulva, first response was always, you mean the car? And um, it was confusing to people. And why should we confuse them? Because I'm insisting on being politically correct. No, if you understand and you mean women's genitals and you want to use the word vagina, that's great. What's important is that you respect them and you have awe and wonder for what they are and what they can do. And that's the important thing in my mind. I've kind of shifted my thinking on, on the absolute correctness of this, that, or the other. So in the book now, I mean, in illustrations, I have the word vulva, but in the text, I refer to it as a vagina now. So I don't know whether I'm taking a step back or what, but again, I, I've, you see some of the new research with with interviews with young adults, and they have such negative things to say about women's genitals. I just felt it was more important that we use a word that everyone's comfortable with and then talk about it in a wonderful and awe-inspiring way. Mm. Yeah, that's lovely. I also talk about that idea too. I think you mentioned the metaphor of the face, right? That if if all I was saying. Yeah. And so I kind of get to be a little bit of a stickler, but part of what you're inviting, I think with your style is flexibility and normalization. And that no matter where people are at, I mean, if you're used to using the word vulva and 
and you started off with that. And I, of course, recommend parents to use those types of terms. Great. But if you're not, like you're saying, we also need to meet people where they're at and that that's more important than getting caught up in some of the details that are not really at the heart of what we're trying to get at, which is good sex between good relationships. Yeah, I think that's where we need to keep our focus because that's what people need from us. Yeah. You know, there's certainly changes there. <laughs> yeah. Well, and this you time, can't be too stuck in your ways. I, yes, I agree. Right, I agree. And we can get stuck in our ways as sex therapists or educators, you know, as far as what we feel is correct and things of that nature. So I appreciate that thought. This might be a question that's really too big in scope because, you know, a lot of times when I'm interviewing people <laughs> about a topic, it's like a pretty specific topic. So there's lots of questions I can ask about that given topic. And like I said, you kind of cover the gamut of sexual behavior and acts. Are there maybe three to five bullet points that you would say, look, out of all the things that I cover, these are kind of the ones that either people tend to need the most or the most commonly questioned about or... Like, how would you break down the massive amount of information into a few bullet points that we could cover in this interview? Okay. There's always been a perception that if a man is a good lover, he'll know how to please me. But women will, will say that. And uh, it sort of takes the fun out of it if I have to tell him, you know, likewise. But with so much porn now, there's the idea that just, once a penis gets hard, a woman's going to be pleased. What I keep reminding people is that everybody's body is different. One woman's clitoris may have 5,000 nerve endings in a certain part of it. Another woman's may have five in that part of it. So just because your former partner got off when you did X, Y, and Z, your new partner may find that boring or painful. You need to explore. You need to experiment and you need to give each other lots of feedback. And I also try to tell women and men, you know, clitorises are fascinating. Don't think you're going, if you're a guy or you're male, don't, don't think you're going to know how to get a woman off by touching her clitoris the first time or even the 50th time. She may have to show you and teach you and show you and teach you because your hands might be used to doing something entirely different from what her hands are used to doing. Mm. So it's all about don't assume. Understand, you need to talk to each other. You need to find a language, and that's not always easy, to find a language to talk about what feels good and what doesn't, what fantasies I want to explore, which ones I don't. But that's really important. And so that would be, for me, one of the biggest bullet point right there. I love it. Uh, each new relationship is an exploration. I did a video on the clitoris that's on YouTube, and you know, I showed different women's clitorises, and it, it can be as different as night and day. Some you don't even see the tip. Others, you know, the tip almost comes out and shakes your hand. And then again, just because one the tip is larger doesn't mean that it's more sensitive. It might be less sensitive. You just don't know. You don't know what does and doesn't work. The way a woman's uterus is pointed, if she's got a tilted uterus, it may make certain rear entry positions uncomfortable. So just because your former partner was like the queen of the reverse cowgirl, your current partner might not like that. She may find good old missionary position just the most incredible thing on the planet. And that's another problem I have with Cosmo. Cosmo and I don't get along particularly well. We haven't over the years. <laughs> They keep forgetting, and every once in a while, they have a new writer who will call me and say, hey, we're doing a story on advanced sex positions. And I'd say, oh, we, advanced sex positions. And yes, really positions that couples who are really, you know, incredible at sex like, you know, to do. <laughs> and I said, okay, so if a couple likes missionary position sex, and she has incredible orgasms that way, and she finds it just wonderful. I, we're basically telling them they're a little retarded, right? They're not really advanced. Oh gosh, yeah, that's so unfortunate. It's the yoga, uh, the yoga positions that are advanced. If you can do good yoga, right? <laughs> not whether or not. Yes, you have that's good a, orgasms. <laughs> Yes, the, the, yes. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's 
<laughs> yeah. yeah how, how we measure in a sense that that's a measurement stick right like this is this is what we're going to deem advanced or the right type of sex versus other types of sex and and that's so unfortunate because like you're saying missionary position sex can be very boring for one couple missionary position sex can be like the most wonderful way people connect and it can be a mixture of the two as well you know and so that's a lot of what I meant by the act-based measurements you know like we're going to take this particular act and we're going to make a position on it versus understanding all the context around it yes yes and uh and again, I think that's something that we as sex therapists, or I'm not a sex therapist, but I say as sex educator, we sometimes forget as well. We have this, this idea that, you know, something has to be one way or another. I think a lot of sex educators and therapists were pushing BDSM and thinking, wow, that is so cool, you know, couples who are into BDSM. Well, maybe for people who are into BDSM, but not for a lot of other people. Right. That's right. <laughs> Right. Everybody has um, their, t- their sexual templates and their erotic preferences, and they differ for a variety of reasons. And it's perfectly fine yeah. where you're at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think so. Again, maybe the thing you work on best is to make it safe for your partner to tell you what they do and don't like mm-hmm. and to really listen. And like you said, that trust factor is huge. Time and time again, we keep seeing, I keep seeing, you know, college instructors will tell me, yep, heard it again on a, you know, another student wrote a paper or whatever, how she, or she's not feeling comfortable with what her partner does, but doesn't want to tell him because she doesn't want to hurt his feelings. That's right. And on the one hand, that's really lovely that she doesn't want to hurt his feelings. (laughs) But this is not the way to have good sex. (laughs) Yeah, on the other hand. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And that's an interesting thing I've talked about before too, is protection constructs, right? We want to protect each other out of love, out of concern, maybe even out of personal embarrassment. I'd like to protect you from knowing these embarrassing parts about myself (laughs) that might make me uncomfortable. And yet that's not really what intimacy is about. And I guess I'd like for you to maybe finish with you mentioned at the very beginning that even though technology has changed and even though some of the images that people grow up with have changed, you seem to allude to the idea that there are hopes and desires and wants that really haven't changed. Can you touch on that? Because I think that that's really what we're kind of getting at, that sex is one tool, (laughs) one avenue to get to that piece. Okay, I'll tell you two things. One... Uh, there was an instructor at Santa Barbara. They've used my uh, book for years, and uh, we keep in close contact. And I got a lot of things from her students on casual sex that I've used in the casual sex chapter. And I said, you know, I'm kind of envious because when I was that age, we didn't really have too much casual sex. And boy, wouldn't it be nice? And she said, don't bet on it. <laughs> she said, I... I'm the one who's on the forefront talking to these students about their casual sex lives. And I'm not hearing necessarily a great deal of happiness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's um, the regrets we have that don't need to be regrets. Like that's yeah. <laughs> kind of people in my office who had a lot of casual sex and they'll say something like, boy, I wish I would have waited for a more special encounter. Then I have all the people who waited and they'll be like, oh, I kind of regret not having explored my sexuality, right? And so it's kind of like grass is always greener. And instead of just saying, yeah, this was my sexual journey, this is what happened in my sexual journey, and I can own that and accept that and decide how I want to go forth with the rest of my sexual journey. <laughs> yes, God, that is so true. And yes. Then the other thing I would say is something another college instructor sent me. She, she sent some of her students comments about at the end of the course, what their concerns are about sex and their relationships. And she said, am I wrong? Or does this look like it could have been written in 1950 or 1970? And she was absolutely right. There were a lot of the same concerns. Many of them focused on relationship concerns. Right. <laughs> you know, so it was fascinating. Uh, a lot of the concerns were really the issue is totally right. If we had read this in 1960, I would have said, oh, this is 1960. But no, it's today. And so there are a lot of the same concerns. 
Uh, we certainly do it differently. You know, you might be sexting your partner and that's just fine. I don't have a problem with sexting partners because I did it to start, but then I, I woke up and said, hey, this is a different generation. They look at privacy different. And if they want to sex, probably if I were a teenager, I'd be loving to sex to partner at the time if, if I had that option. But so the technology is different. The way we relate is different. But I think a lot of the same, ultimately, the hopes and dreams are very similar. Which I'm guessing have to do with attachment and companionship and respect and trust and stability I, and mystery. I, and all of those things that I think are pretty basic to the human. I think you nailed it with all those. Yeah. I think that's exactly it. We're coming obviously to the end of the time that I had said I would spend with you. And, and I just was hoping maybe you could give me some final thoughts or what are some of the things that you'd like to close this interview out with as far as reaching out to those who might be listening. Now that's a tough one for me. <laughs> yeah. you, you got me. You, you stumped me there. I stumped you. I, no. I <laughs> you, you, you totally stopped me. <laughs> I don't know what to say for a final thought. This is the afterglow part mm -hmm. of the interview. <laughs> that's, that's, that's so darn final. <laughs> oh, just try to have fun. Yeah. <laughs> that would be. It's well, not easy. Which is so part of your title, right? The guide to getting it on. Like, let's get on. Let's get, you know, let's have a green light. Let's have fun. Let's make the best out of these types of experiences. And I think that is one of the sadnesses or tragedies of doing sex therapy work is just how much sadness and anxiety and angst and relational kind of, I think, missteps or ruts that people get into because it is just so hard to talk about these things. We've not really provided the skill sets necessary for making these conversations so much easier. And that's why I so value your work. I think it's a huge step in that direction. Well, thank you. Thanks so much. And I, again, I think you've, you've said it as well as it can possibly be said. Life gets in the way and we don't really help people in our culture you think, you know, sex is the one freebie that should help make up for some of the just awful things we have to deal with in life. But we don't do a very good job of making it, a, you know, one of the real pluses of being alive. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. One of the great pluses of being alive. Yes. So for those of you who have listened, thank you. And, you know, I know I'm talking to a Mormon audience. I know some of the things maybe in this book might be challenging to look at or read. I will say the illustrations are all drawings so there's no actual pictures of people that would be you know like photographs so that oftentimes makes a difference for people to feel a little bit more comfortable and I encourage people to really understand the difference between educational illustrations versus what might seem like pornography to some and to stay open because again a big part of what I'm hoping to do through this podcast is to encourage Mormons to really start becoming comfortable with their adult sensibilities in regards to sexuality, that you're no longer adolescents, that you are sexually autonomous and agents of your sexuality, and that you can pick up a book like this and find the parts that are helpful, ignore the parts that you don't find helpful. It can still be a very good resource for you that you do not need to be either afraid of or worried about, or even if it does rub up against some of your values, that that's a good exercise in of itself is just to look at why that's the case and why there are parts that you maybe you're not comfortable with. So Paul, thanks again so much for being on the show and I wish you the best with all the work that you're doing and I hope our paths cross at some point professionally. Well, thank you. And I hope this so too. Thank you so very much. And, uh, Thank you for the work you do. I realize it's not always easy, is it? Yeah, I don't think none of this is work is always easy, but I do sure enjoy it. I love helping people move in positive directions in this area of their lives. And so much of that happens in my work and with people I get to know. So as I'm sure you see that as good. Well, very rewarding. Very good. Okay. Thank you for your time. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> We took the
ลองรู้ทงทนไม่เนิ่นสิ้นทำไมรู้ As the evening traveled on, the sunset bathed your smile. We stopped beneath the desert stars, wrapped in each other's arms. Was as simple as I love you, an ordinary, extraordinary. Sometimes we fell apart. We always came back home. Was as simple as I love you, an ordinary, extraordinary. It's as simple as our love is. 